and welcome to Tenterfield. We're continuing our Aussie Bible study in my hometown, a little township of Tenterfield in far northern New South Wales and on the Highland and we're celebrating autumn and loving the change of the seasons and you can probably hear, possibly hear in the background some of the birds that are uh, whistling and singing and carrying on and enjoying the day and we're celebrating today with the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Last week we discussed briefly Paul's first letter to that church and uh, some of the issues that had arisen. Uh, Paul had visited the town and we mentioned that he was only there for three, maybe four weeks. He was only there for a very short period of time and then was forced to leave. Uh, when he left, uh, he sent Timothy back to find out how the church was going, probably three to six months after uh, he'd left the town. And Timothy came back with news that the church was doing very, very nicely, thank you. But they did have a few small problems. So Paul had written 1 Thessalonians and answered some of those problems. And then later on, he heard that there were some further problems that had arisen. And so he wrote another letter, 2 Thessalonians. And this is the letter that we're looking at today. Some Bible scholars say that these two letters to the church at Thessalonians were the first two books in the New Testament as we know it. Uh, there is some discussion whether Galatians might have preceded that or come later on. There's another discussion altogether. We're not going there today. But this is very early in the letter writing in Paul's career. And he writes to them because he became aware of two problems that had arisen. Some people had sort of suggested that maybe the Lord had already come and the people in the church had missed out somehow or other or they just had a really confused idea of what Paul was saying about the second coming of the Lord. There are others who had decided, well, if the Lord's going to come back next week, why would I be bothered looking after my family? Why would I be bothered working? Why, why don't I just sit back, put my feet up and enjoy myself for a week or two and when the Lord comes back, he'll take me away. And sometimes we hear people carry on a little bit like that in the church today. But Paul writes very clearly addressing those two problems. So he first starts out with a thanksgiving grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. And of course, that's a challenge I find. Paul, if you came and visited with me, went away. I wonder if you'd be boasting to other people about what you found in my life. Would I be a boasting point for somebody like the Apostle Paul? And he goes on, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right and as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back double to those who trouble you. And if you want a little a thought you can bury away in your head when somebody's causing you pain, God is returning double for the trouble. He rewards us gladly. He's going to uh, pay back uh, trouble to those who trouble you and will give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marvelled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony in you. 
And when we go down to chapter 2, he starts addressing this problem of the misconceptions concerning the second coming of the Lord. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. I must admit that uh, I suspect we're into the time of rebellion right now, uh, but we're still looking to see where this man of doom is coming from. And he goes on, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through the belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. But then he goes on and warns against idleness. So I've jumped across chapter 3 and going down to verse 6. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we understand that Paul, working as a tent maker, as a tradesman, was very often working at night uh, doing his tent making, and then during the day doing his teaching, just so that he wasn't a burden to the people he was visiting with. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. And these comments come as a response for the information Paul was getting that these people were being idle based on their understanding that the Lord was coming back. Why bother working? He goes on and says, We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy, but they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed, yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. In summarising this particular book, I have heard people comment and say, look, we need to live our lives day by day, as if we knew the Lord was coming back this very afternoon. We need to have our 
the things within our spirit set right. But we also need to plan our lives as if we knew the Lord wasn't coming back for another hundred years and make sure that we are planning to take care of ourselves so that we're not depending on somebody else and on care of our families and those around us. We live as if we might go today, but we also live as if, yes, Lord may leave us here for a long time. You'll notice there's a button on the screen to go to the next study. We encourage you to do that. May you stay in the Word, and may the Word stay in you. God bless you.